hello, Erin. Um, we have got Dr. Erin Higgins with us today from the ARMA Observatory. And um, as part of the Women in STEM series, these little conversations that we're going to be doing with the science room, Erin is going to come along and talk to us today about her career in astrophysics. So uh, just a little bit of background. Erin um, started out doing her bachelor's degree in physics and astrophysics in Queens in Belfast then went on to complete her PGCE in secondary education and uh, particularly in teaching physics. And then uh, went on and completed her PhD in um, between Queen's ARMA Observatory and the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. So plenty of people to work with there and plenty of supervisors, I'm sure to keep happy there, Erin. <laughs> um, okay, so Erin, can you tell me a little bit about your research? I know there's lots of really cool stuff to do with stars and black holes and things. Yeah. So I study the lives of the most massive stars in the universe. Um, these are the stars that become black holes. So they're very exciting, very interesting at the minute because of these gravitational waves, which are like ripples in space time. Um, so recently we reproduced the, the life of the star that would create the heaviest black hole that we could detect with these gravitational waves. So we track things like the elements that come from the stars that are then spread out and then are important for our lives. So the iron in your blood or the calcium in your bones, all of these heavy elements are formed in the cores of the stars that I study. So I use kind of uh, calculations and, and models in computer simulations to calculate the lives of the stars and then track them through their lives. So. Fantastic. So is there any potential for our sun to have a, a supermassive black hole eventually? No, I think we're safe there. So the star has to be uh, pretty large before you, you get a black hole. So it needs to be about 10 to 20 times bigger than the size of our sun. So we're safe for now. Oh, that's good. <laughs> well, I don't think we'll be around to witness it anyway. Um, so what got you involved in astrophysics then? Um, how come it was a career path that you ended up going down? Well, I had two teachers um, in my secondary school in Thornhill College in Derry, which were um, really enthusiastic about physics and astrophysics, and they held an astronomy club. So we did some observations late at night and things like that. Um, and they set me up with some work experience at the Arma Observatory, and I absolutely loved it. So um, I went on to do my physics and astrophysics bachelor's and at the time enrolled to do my PDC, but I kind of missed the astronomy side of things. So I went back and did more work experience and found out that when I spoke to all of the astronomers that were there, I was still really, really interested and it was something I really wanted to do. So I enrolled then to do the PhD and I've been doing it ever since. Good, good. So is it always then what you wanted to do? It's something from whenever you were younger, you've kind of worked towards? Probably since I was about 16. I've always been very science driven um, and mathematics and things like that. But um, I would say only whenever I really went and did my bachelor's that I knew that it was astrophysics that I wanted to do. So how much your uh, work experience has kind of led into that? Has it helped you drive the way to do that and helped you kind of get started in making those connections? Yeah, I think that work experience is really, really important, um, particularly in STEM, because there's so many aspects in, in science that you can get involved in. You know, you can do the observation side of things or the theoretical side of things or calculations or the engineering side of it. So I think that doing work experience is a really important part of deciding what career you want to have. And it was for me, at least. And the second time I went back, that kind of concreted my initial idea that I did want to do astrophysics. So it was hugely important. How has it developed then you finishing your PhD and going into working in the ARMA Observatory? And how do you kind of see that kind of career developing then in the future? Do you have any big plans? Yeah, well, when you finish your PhD um, and you want to stay in academia, you can apply to do um, postdoctoral research. So I was very lucky to get a position within the ARMA Observatory to stay and work on the topic that I work on, which is the most massive stars. Um, but it kind of has developed into now helping to organize conferences and things like this and organizing seminars and um, just kind of broadening the, the general career path and working on multiple different collaborations. So I work now with um, a nuclear network as well, people who work more on nuclear physics rather than astrophysics. And you can kind of build these collaborations to try and tie back how you can trace these elements out through the universe from the nuclear side of things and then you plug that under the, the code for the astrophysics side of things. So it's important that as you develop your career that you broaden um, these topics as well and start to collaborate with more people. And because it's a global topic as well, it, it's nice that you're working with people all around the world, um, which is a huge part of it as well. 
aside from your um, bachelor's degree and your PhD, are there any particular skills or qualifications then that you would say you definitely need or that you would recommend? Um, well, for the, for the career itself, um, a lot of the advice that I would give is, you know, think about what it is that you really enjoy. Do you enjoy maths and, and science? And is it the investigating things that you're interested in? You can always develop your skills. I think that people um feel that there can be barriers that you can't join um a community because you maybe don't have coding experience i certainly didn't have a lot of coding experience whenever i started my phd and it was something that was a huge part of my phd um run on these simulations but i developed my skills throughout my phd and you build upon that so as long as you're interested and passionate about what it is that you're interested in um i think that having that initial um, passion and interest and especially in science if you're kind of inquisitive about things and curious that's that's the main thing. So obviously it's not all uh, plain sailing but there are massive rewards for working in science as well aside from just being able to work in the thing that really really interests you um, and there are always going to be ups and downs in scientific careers. Uh, so what would you say are the kind of best aspects of it that you enjoy and then kind of the most challenging aspects of it as well? Um, well, the, the best aspects are probably that you get to see the world. I mean, within the first year of my PhD, I was in New Zealand for two weeks and California for six weeks and Vienna and Lyon and all of these wonderful places. Um, so you get to work with people around the world and you get to see the world and you know you're really operating at the frontier of science which is part of why research is so exciting um now these things can also be your downfall in that you know it's uncharted territory so whenever you're doing research you can sometimes get stuck on a problem and not know how to fix it but um that's the nature of the job and you know if you're getting into a career like this you need to consider whether that travel and it's not really a nine to five job, you know, you, you kind of work, if, especially if you're working on observations, you might be working on a telescope in the evenings or, um, but again, you know, th these are nice trips. So I went to La Palma and you're up above the clouds looking out over, um, you know, the constellations and, and everything. And it's, it's a double edged sword, I guess, you know, the, the traveling. So it's, it's up to you whether that works, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a Hawaii is one of those places I would always love to go to. And I'm sure um, getting to go and see the observatories in Hawaii and everything else would just be make it completely worth it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how have you managed then with setbacks? Uh, obviously, I know within um, doing PhDs in academia, you have to apply for funding. Um, there are always going to be people applying for jobs or different um, positions and things. So how do you cope then whenever things just don't immediately go to plan or even just within your research, it never works out straight the first time around? Yeah, absolutely. I think that you just have to stay motivated and, and try not to let every um, setback become uh, personal or or something that is just about your ability or your skill set because everybody encounters these problems and it doesn't matter what stage in your career you're at you're always going to face something so as long as you're motivated to try and fix the problem um, and you just work at it um, and yeah just be open-minded and how you can fix it and reach out to colleagues and get advice brilliant brilliant help <laughs> one of the best words you could say <laughs> yeah so um any words of wisdom then for girls who are entering stem and for young people in general but particularly girls given that it's international women's day that we're looking at this for yeah um well i would say that try and get some work experience and um you know learn about what it is that you really enjoy what aspect of science or stem is it that really excites you and um i suppose just Try and keep in touch with what science is in the news as well and, and read up on um, popular science that, that's ongoing at the minute um, mm -hmm. and see what aspect of that excites you as well. And then lastly, just before we finish up, um, this year's theme for International Women's Day is Break the Bias. And um, obviously you only need to read um, a short bit on the internet or different reports and you can see uh, particularly in STEM, there has been this kind of long running drive to increase uh, the amount of women and girls entering into STEM subjects. Um, so where do you see opportunities to break the bias then in your particular field? Well, I think that when I when I joined, I expected it to be a male dominated field, which it is, um, you know, at a certain career level, because it takes time to change these biases. But 
Um, certainly when I joined my PhD, it was actually predominantly females that were PhD students. So the number of females, even in the four years that it takes to complete your PhD, the number of females that I've seen um, doing their PhDs and presenting at conferences has dramatically changed. So there are biases and there are, um, you know, it, it is predominantly male beyond a certain point, but I think that it is changing. Just give it time. We'll get yeah. there. <laughs> That's yeah. super. Thank you so much, Erin. That has been really, really interesting. It's always great to get chatting, especially to people who are doing really interesting research in local areas. I know um, I would take my own children up to Armagh Planetarium quite a lot. They love the dome shows and the um, the walks outside and everything. But it's brilliant to know that there's this really amazing research that's just happening right on our doorsteps. And yeah, I think Northern Ireland's doing quite well for a lot of these things. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you very much and um, good luck with all the rest of the research. And the next time we're looking up at the sky, we'll be thinking of you all. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.